Hello everybody, my name is Ratnos, and in this video, I've been a little bit inspired by my friend Tettles, who has been making videos that are like systems in review of previous expansion content. Uh, some of the some of which are actually up here. Some of these he hasn't gotten to, and I'm sure he will. Uh, I'll link those in the description of this video. And what I want to do is I want to use these systems to talk about why myself and a lot of other players are not content with waiting and seeing what will happen with the covenant system and are instead not going to accept the answer you know just we'll, it'll be okay just wait we've thought of these things so here i'm, I'm going to start by framing my argument this way uh with these four expansion systems that have existed uh so legion legendaries from legion of course uh that existed throughout the whole expansion they came out in patch 7.0 and these were awesome these were really cool effects. They really improved your character in massive different ways. They changed how your spec played often. One problem with them, particularly in 7.0, was it was very hard to get any specific one, right? It, you were going to get maybe one over the first month of the expansion, maybe another one over the next month or two, unless you were really lucky and you got that bug where you got like multiple drops in the first week, which a couple people did get. For the most part, you were... Yeah, like in Emerald Nightmare, I think I had three total legendaries on my character, uh, and they were Agrimar's Stride, Pride As before it was buffed, and Cephas's Secret before it was buffed. So uh, those were like three of the most just awful legendaries, barely worth equipping, uh, largely. You know, they were still high item level, but uh, for the spec I was playing at the time, Arms Warrior, they weren't even particularly well itemized, So, uh, and that was a spec that really cared about how the stats worked out on stuff. So it ended up being pretty... It's not It's not that it wasn't a power level increase for me, but it was just the difference between that and getting stuff like, you know, the Execute item or the Mortal Strike item would have just been massive, massive deltas in terms of damage. Uh, so that was kind of a common problem that a lot of people had with Legion Legendaries. The Fire Mage Bracers, the Demon Hunter Ring. These were huge amounts of power. They were fun to play with often. But everybody didn't... You didn't all get them, right? Not, everybody, not every player got them. And particularly... People who wanted to play multiple specs, you kind of, you kind of couldn't easily. Like, I mean, the odds of getting good legendaries for two different specs was astronomically harder than getting good legendaries for one spec, especially in the first couple patches. So I would say that was a big problem with Legion legendaries, right? Accessibility. It was really hard, man. Okay, there we go. Really hard to get the right legendaries, the legendaries that were good for you. And you got to see that other people had them and it really didn't, really didn't feel satisfying to see other people having the legendaries that were way better than you and, you know, getting invited to stuff, being able to do stuff at a higher level than you could because you randomly didn't get the right one. Now, pro of the system was definitely, they were really awesome, right? Awesome effects. That was awesome to see. Uh, and one thing that they did eventually is in patch 7.1, actually and throughout patch 7.0, they improved accessibility. In patch 7.2, they improved it again. And in patch 7.3, they added a vendor, and it became effectively trivial to get whatever legendaries you wanted. Uh, and so they, over the course of the expansion, right, uh, over time, fixed over time, right? It took them about a year and a half, I'd say. A year to a year and a half, depending on which patch version you think was good, uh, to get legendaries into a state that were pretty good in terms of accessibility, right? Uh, so uh, call it about 1 to 1.5 years when over, over time this system was fixed. Now, Azerite Armor came out in BFA, and this was a system that, in my opinion, it didn't really bring all that much. It was kind of a replacement of tier sets in terms of you had the system that was supposed to come in and, and give your characters cool new power. For me, this one came with a lot of cons. We kind of kept the same Azerite Armor for the whole expansion, right? They talked about there'd be new powers over different patches, but there weren't really that... I mean, for the most part, you're playing the same traits that you're playing in Old Deer, right? There were these patch-specific ones like Heart of Darkness, um, Treacherous Covenant. Uh, what, was the, what was the Eternal Palace one? There was one in Eternal Palace. There was like uh, Laser Matrix and the other one from Old Deer as well. And those were all like good, but none of them really changed how you played, right? They were all just stats or damage procs or whatever. Uh, so... For the most part, the only ones that change the way your class played are the same ones you've been using since Old Deer. And there was there was an exception where they changed around how some of them worked in 8.1. They released some new Azerite armor traits. And notably, they went from having one big trait on each Azerite armor to two, which I think improved the system largely. 
Um, but for the most part, the system is in a pretty similar state to how it launched, with the exception of accessibility. When the system first launched, and actually in <laughs> in uh, their original in implementation of Azerite armor, you couldn't swap the armor at all. They quickly added in a reforge where you could swap the armor, but the price doubled every single time you did it. And that price only dropped every every three days, that price would get cut back in half. So uh, the end result of that being if you ended up having a piece of Azerite armor that you wanted to switch more than twice per week, or two pieces of Azerite armor that you wanted to switch each of them more than once per week, then that price would quickly spiral out of control, right? Anything like that, it's very quickly going to get to a point where you're unable to... Like, it's, it's not really a gold sink. People talk about, oh, they just wanted a gold sink, but something that scales exponentially in gold price like that... You know, there are going to be a couple of crazy people in World First Guilds that will pay the 40k and the 80k and the 160k reforges. But for the most part, it mostly just meant that you would look at it and you'd be like, hey, I want to go do this dungeon as subtlety. That's going to require me to reforge three of my Azerite pieces. And then I'll have to reforge them back for raid. So I'm going to be looking at six reforges. That's going to cost me, you know, 250k to go and do this dungeon as subtlety. I'm not going to pay 250k to go do this dungeon as subtlety, right? I'm just not going to do it. So uh, it shut off that portion of the game, right? You were looking at this option to play a new spec, but it was hugely costly. And as much as you might have some fun playing subtlety in a dungeon, or as much as you might be interested in trying out, you know, what's the difference between Longstrider and Resounding Protection for this? Is Longstrider actually something I want to mess around with? You really couldn't justify swapping Azerite armor very often for those sorts of effects. So I would describe this as a problem of the accessibility of those effects as well, right? Uh, you couldn't, you could not actually try out most of the different Azerite effects, and particularly, like with Legion Legendaries, I'll put this in here as well, multi-spec, question mark, question mark, question mark. This, is a this was a problem with Legion Legendaries, especially initially, and with Azerite Armor too, right? If you, if you wanted to use the same armor piece for two different specs, and you wanted to play those two different specs with any degree of regularity, you were just, you were just in trouble, right? You couldn't really do that unless you dropped the, a second copy of the same piece of Azerite Armor. Now, they improved the system over time, they made it so that it would have every day instead of every three days the price. I still believe that that was not a great system, but this was slowly fixed, right? We'll say eventually largely fixed. Why does Paint have such narrow default text box windows is my question. Also, what kind of YouTuber would use Paint for this sort of video? Another question that uh, is a very valid one that I'm sure many of you are asking. So uh, we'll call this one. This one was fixed about... About six months into the expansion was when I'd say that, for the most part, Azerite Armor got to be in an okay state. I'm going to leave the pros column largely empty for this. Azerite Armor did some good stuff, but I think the comparison to stuff like tier sets is pretty negative for Azerite Armor in terms of how much actual fun, cool class stuff they brought. All right, let's talk about Essences. Essences, there were a couple of good ones. There were a couple of ones that I thought were actually pretty good gameplay. So uh, a few had good gameplay. A few were awesome. I'll use the word awesome because that's nice. That's a nice word. Uh, this is stuff like, I'd say like Vision Major was a pretty unique and cool effect. Lucid Dreams Major. Those were, these were effects where they really changed how your character played. Even Reaping Flames Major, actually. Uh, those were, these are effects that were cool, had interesting and different gameplay, and often behaved differently depending on which class you were playing, right? Depending on which spec you were playing. Uh, stuff like Lucid Major has a really different feel on something like an Arms Warrior versus something like a Fire Mage. Stuff like Vision Major, I mean, it's hugely different depending on which spec you're playing. Uh, and of course, for some of them, it wasn't good. One problem I had with Essences was a lot of them were just the, followed the same template, right? There was like, once every cooldown length, press this button, and it will deal some damage. It'll deal a lot of damage. It'll deal a huge amount of damage even, but many of the Essences, you know... Largely, uh, Blood of the Enemy, Crucible Flame, Condensed Life Force, uh, Azerite Beam. All of these were basically, you know, with, with little exception, there was some gameplay to some of them. But for the most part, they were, press this button on cooldown, it will do a lot of damage. Uh, so I would say most were kind of boring, was, a, was a, a drawback of this system. Another drawback of this system was accessibility. With this system... In order to get access to some of the essences, like Blood of the Enemy, as particularly on launch, you were looking at a 50,000 honor grind. And this was for, this was a, a, Blood of the Enemy was an essence that was basically useless in PvP, right? You very rarely use this thing in PvP. It was a Mythic Plus all-star, though, and in some cases it was useful in raid as well. So this was just a best-in-slot essence where, in order to get access to it, you needed to do the one thing it wasn't actually good for. Similarly, something like Vitality Conduit. That's something that you got from Eternal Palace, but was basically only used in 
in PvP, right? So there were a lot of these essences where the source of acquiring them was diametrically opposed to the source where they were actually playable. Um, also, one problem with this was the alt experience, right? You were rolling up an alt and just you're looking at this essence system again and you're like, man, I have to grind, I have to grind all these essences again. I often, often people would ask me what alts to roll up and I would tell them, play a Havoc Demon Hunter because your good essences are easy to get, right? You're going to get your Focusing Iris for free from doing your weekly Mythic Plus for a couple weeks in a row. Bang. Easy essence, right? I would not advise people to go and do something where they needed to get Blood of the Enemy on an alt because that was a horrific grind. Or even Condensed Life Force, stuff like that. Like, a lot of alts were not interested in stepping into Azhar's Eternal Palace for five weeks in a row to get access to an essence, right? That's the kind of grind that is acceptable on mains, but is not really acceptable on alts. So... That was a big problem that Essences had, and notably, it was a problem that was identified with Essences in the patch 8.2 PTR. It was discussed largely during the entirety of patch 8.2, and for the entire time, Blizzard said, we're not planning to change this. This isn't a problem. This is how we think it should be. It was not a case of, of them being like, yeah, we, we see that there's some issues here. It was a case of them being like, Essences are, this is the way they are, you know, this is, get used to it, to the point where most people just kind of accepted that they were going to be like that, right? Uh, I grinded out seven copies of Blood of the Enemy, uh, which was, you know, obviously a crazy thing that most people shouldn't do, but I play this game a lot. I play this game uh, as a, a primary source of income, so that's what that's what I was doing with my days. And I, it was a fun thing to do during Comp Stomp Week and, you know, whatever. Most people didn't end up doing that. Most people just ended up either playing suboptimally, like they would play on their characters without Blood of the Enemy, and that, that was a, a bad feeling. Particularly, it was bad. I, I was like this for a while as well. You know, I grinded out seven of them eventually, but... At the start of the patch, I didn't have Blood of the Enemy on my Rogue for a lot longer than a lot of other people did, and I was really holding back my groups by not having that. Um, there's going to be an argument in the comments below about whether Blood of the Enemy is even good, by the way. It is good. There's, you know, the Sims. <laughs> I don't I don't want to get into this discussion again, but it's a lot better than the Sims would suggest, and if you don't believe me, look at all the top runs and all the Rogues, basically 90% plus playing Blood of the Enemy, and the places you see Focusing Iris are often for specific reasons. Um, but anyways... What was I saying? Before we got... Man, I got, I sidetracked myself into the Blood versus Iris discussion. Anyways, all, what I meant to say is that this was really a really unpleasant feeling because you felt like in, you needed to go through this horrific access, accessibility you know, struggle in order to not be holding back your group, right? Uh, and that is something that not everybody feels this way and not every group... You know, I, I wasn't in any groups that were particularly like telling me that I needed to go get Blood of the Enemy. I mean, maybe I was in a couple of groups where they said that, but... Uh, you know, that, that's, that many groups are not going to be like that. But for, for a lot of players, even if you're not actually trying to push a plus 25 key, a plus 30 key, even if you're just doing your, you know, you're trying to push a plus 17 key with your friends, you still would rather have the reason you depleted the key be because you messed something up, right? Be because you had something you could learn. You'd rather not have it be that you're playing two keystone levels below where you could be because you didn't grind 30,000 honor or 50,000 honor from Battlegrounds, right? Now... With Essences, this was, again, after they talked about not changing anything for it for a year, they did eventually fix this, right? Eventually fixed about one year later. In 8.3, they made these purchasable account-wide. That fixed the problem for alts. It actually didn't ever fix the problem for first-time players on characters. You still did need to grind Blood of the Enemy once on one character. And that, I, to me, that still was not great. Uh, particularly if you, if you returned to the game in patch 8.3 and you were like... I want to play this. I want to play Condensed Life Force, and you're looking at grinding Azara's Eternal Palace for four weeks in order to get access to that essence. I mean, in many ways, this was still not actually fixed, right? The essence system was fixed for alts. It was not actually the accessibility problems that mains had were still never were, have never been fixed with the system. All right, finally, corruption. Corruption is a system that, in my opinion, there's a huge list of pros for this system. For the first time ever in World of Warcraft history. Gearing actually became kind of an unsolvable problem, or at least a problem that was really hard to solve. And my evidence for this is that the best options for people to use in Corruption are still being hotly debated. And the discovery of, like, versatile sets for everybody in Mythic Plus, that took six months or so for that to become the metagame in Mythic Plus. I cannot imagine a previous patch where we have the level of information accessibility that we have now, where it would take people six months to identify what the best gearing options are. So that for me is a huge, a huge pro of corruption. Not only do you have to figure out which corruptions are best for you, and there's you know huge hosts of offensive and defensive benefits of the different ones, 
You also have to figure out, and they also scale differently into AOE, right? Twilight Devastation versus Echoing Void. They all have different values in AOE versus single target that uh, make them difficult to evaluate. And that is really cool. You also had to identify how much corruption you could figure out, right? You had to set your corruption budget. And one thing that like the Versatile thing did, for instance, is that Versatile changes your corruption budget too, right? You could go up to 60 corruption maybe, or 59, because you've got all this Versatile, so Thing From Beyond isn't going to hit you that hard. Pretty awesome there. For me, this is probably uh, the deepest gear system we've ever had. And this this is really, really, really cool for me. Uh, I think that that upside of corruption is extremely, extremely cool. However, when the corruption system came out, you weren't thinking about, oh, should I play Twilight Dev or Masterful on this fight, right? You were just thinking, all right, I've dropped a Honed Mind piece and an Echoing Void piece. Actually, Echoing Void was good before they nerfed it. Um, but uh, you know, I've got this hone mind piece and this racing pulse piece. Which of these two is better, right? And like sometimes there was there was still interesting decisions to make with your character, but often the actual decisions between the ones that your character got were not close decisions, right? They were just you know you 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 were either lucky and got some good stuff, or you were unlucky and got some bad stuff, and you wore the best set that you could, and you didn't really get to play with this deepest gear system we've ever had unless you played a huge amount of time per day, or whipped out your credit card, bought some WoW tokens, and bought some BOEs from the auction house, which, oh my goodness, that the, the BOE pay-to-win part, for me, is a, a really, really obnoxious con of this system. Not something that a lot of people ran into, but uh, that part, ugh, uh, I, I, hope, I hope that we don't go back to that ever. But the other problem, again, was the accessibility, right? If you wanted to try out these cool two different corruptions and see how one played versus another, you couldn't. You couldn't do that unless you got lucky, or unless you bought them from the auction house. Uh, if you were thinking about all these different possibilities that the system potentially offered you, for most players, you didn't actually have all that many decisions on your gear set. For some players, you did. And there were interesting decisions had by players, particularly high-end players, for the first couple months of the system. But most players didn't really get to that point. For most players, corruption was not like that. Now, this system was eventually fixed. They eventually added in the vendor, that's, uh, it was what, five months into the patch? Four months into the patch? We'll call it four months in. We'll be be as, as charitable as possible. Uh, so they, you know, they, cre they created this vendor. You could get whatever corruptions you wanted. They actually, before they did that, further increased corruption, you know, effects uh, by making it so you could get them guaranteed from your weekly horrific vision instead of just a higher chance. So corruption was something that did get better. It did get to this point where you could actually play around with this, this great deep gear system. There were a couple other minor cons of corruption, you know, uh, hugely RNG-based slash high percentage of your damage came from corruption effects, and pe people don't like that. Uh, for me, that's not as huge of a deal. Like, the fact that, you know, you're, you're looking at a log and it's like 50% infinite stars damage, that's only a couple of fights where that was really problematic and only a couple of specs. I do think that's a slight con, but uh, for me, that that's hugely outweighed by this part. But by far the biggest problem was this accessibility issue, right? None of the pros of corruption are outweighed by the con that the accessibility was. And even with this eventual fix, right, you're in this place now where you can spend 50,000 Echoes of Nihilotha and build a full Corruption set. That's a lot of Echoes of Nihilotha to grind. You aren't in this place where you can actually try out two different Corruption sets without grinding 100,000 Echoes of Nihilotha, or three different Corruption sets for grinding 150,000 Echoes of Nihilotha. So if you want to have two different Corruption sets for two different specs, you're doubling your grind, right? If you want to have uh, two different Corruption sets just to try out two different ones, you're also doubling your grind. That to me is another, that, that's a, a persistent accessibility problem with corruption that is smaller than the initial problem was and is potentially one that I could live with, but is still, it's still not great the difference in experience between somebody particularly. Imagine somebody whose corruption is the same, that their BIS corruption is the same across all their specs versus somebody for whom they are different BIS corruptions across their specs, right? One person just arbitrarily has a four times shorter or three times shorter grind compared to another person based on the spec they've picked and the class they've picked, but not for any actual reason, just because it happens that the corruption system favors that spec or that class by giving them all the same BIS ones, right? Twilight Devastation's BIS for both your specs, Masterful's BIS for both your specs, or whatever, Versatile is BIS for both your specs, and you're just, you're chilling, right? You don't have to do any further work. Uh, like Frost Mage and Fire Mage, you're both Masterful and you're just, you're happy. Uh, but for other specs, you know, you're looking, one spec's like, I, you know, I want Severe and the other spec wants Masterful and you're just like, all right. You know, I, I got to pick, right? I got to pick between these two or grind a lot. So when we talk about 
covenant system. For me, the covenant system looks like it's going to have a massive accessibility problem as well. It's going to have this problem where you need to select one of four options and you get access to that power and you don't ever get to test out the other ones in any serious high level setting. You get to test it out for an hour while you're leveling through that zone and that's it. Uh, you don't actually get to play with it in, in dungeons. You don't get to play with it in raids. You don't get to play with it with all the, the covenants or the conduits and soul binds. You just get to play with it a little bit in the leveling process, see how it maybe basically feels. But in a similar way to the Legion Legendaries and the Corruption, you can see other people using Corruptions or Legion Legendaries that you don't have. Unlike these systems, you can't actually eventually get access to it as well, right? You either, In order to do that, you have to give up what you currently have. So to me, it is not only the same problem that all these systems have had with accessibility, it's worse because... Unlike Legion Legendaries, right, with Legion Legendaries, you'd start off with a random 25% of the Legendaries, and somebody else would have a different random 25%, and you'd look at them, and they'd be doing something you couldn't do, and you'd be like, I want to be able to do that. All right, you know, eventually I'll get that. It's really annoying that it's a super long grind, but if I play this character a lot over the next six months, I will be able to get there. With the, with the Covenant system, you're playing your Covenant, and you see somebody else doing something cool, and you're like, all right, would I like to swap Covenants in order to get access to try that as well? That is not something that it's not something that is going to be a particularly fun experience i think for many people i think you know th this ability to see a cool new build see like you know all crit fire mage minute mage fire mage two minute fire mage these three different builds having to commit to which of those you're going to play before you actually get to play any of them to me is just it, it feels like there's not going to be a, a an actual degree of, of you know choice there you're making a choice based on the looks or a best guess of what those is going to be good, but you're not actually making a choice based on which of those gameplay is the most fun to you because you don't actually get to do the gameplay first. You do eventually get to swap later, but you still retain, you never get to this point that you did eventually get with Legion Legendaries and with Corruption and with Essences where you had access to all of them, right? We are never going to get there with, co uh, with Covenants in their current, current design. So uh, that's one problem I see. The other problem is this multi-spec problem. I talked about it a little bit with Corruption, right? Imagine that world where your BIS covenant is the same for all three of your specs. Imagine how great that would be, right? Imagine that you can just, and not only just this, your specs, but like in Raid and in Mythic Plus, because there's a good chance that there will be a different BIS covenant for the same spec in Raid and in Mythic Plus and in PvP. But for some classes out there, there will probably be some where most or all of those have the same BIS covenant. And those people are going to be like the Havoc Demon Hunters with Essences, where my advice is going to be, play one of those, you'll get to have fun, right? You will get to do whatever you want to do, and you won't feel like you're being held back by the covenant choice that you made. I think that's awful. I, I think that that is, is really, 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 really unfortunate uh, to end up in that spot where you're just looking at, at this covenant you've picked, and you're like, all right, well, I'm playing a class where Holy and Discipline have two completely different covenants that they want, and... You know, I could go and play Holy. I could do it. But do I really want to switch specs and be... And it's not a small amount, right? People are saying it's a small amount like races. Races in WoW are maybe a 1% difference. Covenants look to me like they are 5 to maybe 20% uh, of power level difference. Maybe more in some cases, particularly when there's like a, a useful binary effect, uh, like having a teleport, if that's particularly valuable in a certain case, that's just you either have it or you don't, right? It's not a percentage thing. Um, but... That size difference, not having that, I don't, I don't foresee a spot where I would want to play a different spec and give up that kind of power. But you might luck into it, right? You might luck into picking that one spec, this expansion, that has the same BIS covenant for all your specs, right? In which case, you're super happy. Conduits as well are like this. So for those who don't know, there's these soulbind trees in Shadowlands, and each covenant has three different soulbind trees, and you can swap between them whenever you want. You can swap between the three of them whenever you want, but... Into each of the soulbind trees, you have to slot conduits, and conduits are spec specific, right? Conduits will be like, oh, you know, your uh, sinister strike does extra damage, your you know fireball reduces your cooldown or whatever. I don't, actually, I don't think those are actual ones, but they're spec specific, is what I'm trying to get to, right? Your blood plague does something special. Uh, all of these, there are some that are class specific and spec agnostic, but for the most part, they are spec specific. So within each soulbind, you basically have to designate. You, you have to designate each soulbind as for each spec, right? And you can swap between that once per week. So if your goal, like with Azerite Armor, is I would like to play Subtlety for this dungeon, 
you're just looking at your soulbind tree and you're like, I can't, right? I can't do that unless I'm ready to give up on swapping back for this whole week, right? If I'm unless I'm ready to make this soulbind tree into a, a subtlety tree for the whole week, I can't do that. So it's like the Azerite armor problem, except you don't even then have the option to pay a lot of gold to switch back to whatever spec you were playing before. You're literally just locking yourself into it for the entire week. Now again, you might get lucky, right? Imagine that you've picked a class where you have the same Biss Covenant, but different Biss Soulbind trees for each of your three specs. You don't have this problem at all. That person, wh whatever that class is, gets to just play PvP, Mythic Plus, and Raid, whatever spec they want. They can just do all of those without feeling like they're suboptimal. That might exist. Somebody might get to feel that way. Certainly somebody might get 80% of the way there where you have most of that being true for a certain class. And then there will be some classes where all three of your specs want a different covenant and want it badly. Mage is an example of this where, uh, for instance, for Mage, the Necrolords look really nuts for Arcane, but completely unplayable for Frost and Fire. Uh, and when I say completely unplayable, obviously, you know, I'm exaggerating a little bit here where you can do it and you're not, you're not going to be unable to play the video game. And if you're playing the game at a level where a 10% or 20% power level difference doesn't matter then that's, that's actually where most people are, right? Most people don't play the game at a level that, where that matters. But most people, even the people who play the game at a level where a 10% or a 20% power level difference doesn't matter, where you could kill the boss still or do the dungeon with a 10 to 20% power level difference, would still rather not incinerate 20% of their damage for a cosmetic effect, right? Or incinerate 20% of a spec's damage because they main a different spec. That's still not something that people want to do. And my evidence for this is how much people complain about their spec getting nerfed, even if they're playing the game at a level where every spec matters, right? That is something that we all care about this. We all want to not be arbitrarily suboptimal. So uh, yeah, that's that's going to be... For me, That that is what covenants look like. Covenants look like a absolute rehash of these exact same cons that have happened over and over again. And Blizzard is saying, you know, this time we're paying attention. We're not going to have this fixed over time issue, right? We, we will get this right. We're listening. But I, I don't see it. I don't see it working out this way because to me, I'm hearing the same things that I heard about Essences, which is basically a complete denial that there is a problem and painting the people who are talking about it being a problem as some sort of super high-end elite, as, as, you know, which... In many cases, that those players are concerned by it, but also in many cases, we're the players who are going to be least impacted by this. Because me personally, I could grind seven Blood of the Enemies, right? I can make four Death Knights and just have all four co Covenants that way. I mean, it's going to be a little bit annoying for me, just like how grinding seven Blood of the Enemies is annoying to me, but I'll do it. I, I will. I'm The reason I'm advocating for this is because it's going to be slightly annoying for me and because everybody else is not going to have the option to do that, and uh, you know, nor should they. Playing four Death Knights or playing even two Death Knights is really unpleasant experience that the only reason I would ever do it is if I felt like it was helping my guild. Because for me, helping out my team, that is something that I'm willing to take on some misery for because that's that's the most important thing in the game uh, for me is do, you know being as useful as I can be for my guild. For a lot of people, they, probably, they, they shouldn't do that, right? That's not... It's, it's really unfun to play two copies of the same class. So for most people, you're just going to be locked into a certain covenant. And I think that that experience is going to be a really negative one. I want to close by talking a little bit about. I I don't think that I don't think that this actually has a pro either. I don't think there is a pro to the covenant system in the sense that it is right now in the implementation we're in right now. Right. Ideally, the covenant system is one where you pick a, a covenant based on its aesthetics, based on its lore, based on the flavor, based on the characters, based on where you want to spend your time over the next two years in the Shadowlands, based on what storyline you want to pursue. Um, but. A of all, the story that they're presenting in Shadowlands does not mesh with the idea of exclusively picking one covenant, right? The story in Shadowlands so far is that all four covenants are fundamentally on the same side. They're not at war with each other, except for in some of the quest texts where... The, the quest texts are inconsistent. You can find some where they are fighting each other a little bit, but for the most part, it, the four are allies, right? You're allies trying to help the good of the Shadowlands, right? Um, so exclusively selecting one covenant for story reasons there... I'm not a super lore expert. I, I know a bit. Uh, but for, for it doesn't look like that is a necessary thing for the lore to work. The second thing is, I don't think that that will be a metric by which people will select their covenants en masse if there's power level tied to it, right? If I want to play Kyrian because I think that the Bastion ability is cool, or the Bastion zone is cool, and the, the place where I'll AFK is a Kyrian, you know, that Kyrian order hall place is awesome looking, that would be a great reason to decide to play Kyrian, but I cannot make that decision for that reason, right? As long as there is a power level tied 
above that like 1% mark that races are at to covenants, I can't just pick one based on the lore, based on the, the reasons like that, right? I will just be picking one based on, you know, <laughs> do I want a 10% damage increase or do I want a 2% damage increase? And so I, I not only, not only do we have that drawback of the power level that we talked about earlier, we also don't get the upside of there being a lore choice, right? A flavor choice. For any player that is concerned about min-maxing to, to any extent, or at least making an effort to min-max, you're not going to be picking your covenant based on what looks cool, right? You're going to be picking your covenant based on what you think gives you the best chances of being being good, right? Of being invited to groups, of being a, useful on your team, right? Of being helpful to your guild. Uh, and that is something that is a shame because I think it would be really awesome to actually get that covenant original idea, right? The goal of picking something based on the flavor, based on the lore. And that is something that, in my opinion, you can only get by detaching it from the power level. Think about it this way, right? Because it's attached to the power level, they have to have all of these ways to swap covenants, and they're, they're going to have to, eventually over time, they're going to have to fix it, right? Uh, the question is just whether it's going to be the four months or the one and a half years for me. And if it's the four months, then the expansion will still be okay. Uh, but if it's the one and a half years, that's the whole expansion, right? And like Legion was tarnished by the legendary acquisition problems for the whole expansion, Shadowlands will similarly be tarnished by the covenants for the whole expansion. So for me, it's a question right now of whether we land in that 1.5 years to the four months range for covenants to get fixed. But you still don't get the upside, right? You still don't get the upside of picking a cool lore covenant that you want to go and, and be a member of that covenant, right? You're still just, if they make them more swappable, then you're still just swapping between them very often and you never actually feel like a member of that covenant. Imagine instead if we get to a point where the covenants are detached from power, right? If the covenants do not affect which of these powers that you can get, or maybe they affect which of the ones you can get access to quickly, but you can still grind out all the other ones and then swap between all of them, that would be fine too. Then we can actually make it so that you don't get the opportunity to swap, right? We can make it so this is a binding permanent choice that actually matters for your character's story. We can make it so that this phases the world and this affects the world in permanent and meaningful story ways and because of the fact that covenants are tied to power level, they cannot do that. They cannot make it so that you can't swap covenants, right? They have to make it so that we can swap. They have to do all of these things because it is a, a system that is tied to power level. If you can, if you just detach it from the power level, then not only do we solve all the cons, we also add a bunch of cool pros to the system. So that is my thing on covenants. I hope that I, I really hope that I'm wrong about the system. I hope that, I hope that, we come back in six months and I'm like, I was completely off base. I, cause I want this game to be as great as it possibly can be. But right now, this kind of argument that just, you know, they know what they're doing. Just let it, let it happen is not something that I'm comfortable doing because of how frequently the same problems have arisen over and over again with previous systems with the same messaging coming out of them. So uh, for that reason, I will continue to be vocal about this and I will continue to talk about it. Uh, until such a time as the expansion's over or I feel like it's fixed. Uh, that's, that's the end of this video. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Keep it civil and we'll have, I'm happy to have, happy to have disagreeing viewpoints in the comments, uh, of course, if you have one of those, but uh, if you have something nasty on either, either side of this or whatever, you know, whatever, whatever viewpoint you have is fine, but if it gets nasty in any way, I'm deleting it. So, uh, don't do that. That'll be annoying for me. And also your comment will disappear. Uh, remember to like the video and stuff, subscribe and things. Check out my Twitch stream, twitch.tv slash ratnos. I'll see you in the next one.